Ben, I'm chewing gum. You okay with that? I'm not, actually. Everyone, it's uh, episode 48 of App Percussion. It's June 16th, 2016. Joining me today is Ben Charles. Hi, everybody. And Laurel Black. Hi. Ah, there we go. Megan is out. I think she's traveling down to Chicago. And oddly enough, we just bumped into her in Boston, literally on our way back from the Snow Pond Music Festival slash New England Music Camp slash Ted Agcats Percussion Seminar. Anyway, that's a, a long story we should save for when she's around because we bumped into a whole lot of other people. But our guest today is a percussionist in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra and can be heard on several of their Grammy Award winning recordings. His debut album is the first professional recording of Jacques de la Clouse's 12 Etudes which was released in October of 2014. He previously held a position with the New World Symphony Orchestra. He's also performed with All-Star Orchestra, the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, the Pacific Music Festival Orchestra, and was the timpanist of the National Repertoire Orchestra. As an educator, he is faculty at the Stellenbosch International Chamber Music Festival and has taught clinics and master classes at the Juilliard Summer Percussion Seminar, Aspen Music Festival, Boston University Tanglewood Institute, National Repertoire Orchestra, and the Interlochen Arts Academy. So how's it going, Rob Knopper? It's great. Thank you for all remembering every single thing I've ever done. That's right. I, I remembered all of that and just had to decide, like, okay, when am I going to just stop because there's plenty more. Right. <laughs> yeah, you forgot my um, performance at the uh, Memorial Day Parade in Chelsea, Michigan in uh, 2003. Um, that would have been the missing thing that you left off there. We could just bag it, you know. I think. Uh, yeah, let's start over. <laughs> just... <laughs> so, what are you what are you doing right now? You're in New York, and what's what's current? What's going on? Um, I'm in New York, and I have one of these um, very unusual blocks of days where I have literally nothing, and I don't remember the last time that this has happened to me. Um, but I'm very thankful. <laughs> so, uh, the opera season ended on May seventh, and then we had three weeks of Carnegie concerts, um, and that was after a very intense nine months of opera. Um, basically, we, when, we, when you start in September, it's like a sprint all the way until May, and so I really didn't have any time off then. I can't even think of a day where I didn't have like at least two or three things scheduled, and then uh, I went to, I went to uh, a little vacation with family in France, and now I'm back, and I I'm just enjoying not having an alarm wake me up. Um, I'm thinking <laughs> so much about it. But uh, yeah, that's basically what's current. I'm getting ready for um, a couple weeks I leave for uh, Stellenbosch, which you had mentioned. This will be my third summer teaching there. Um, I'm very excited. I love going to Stellenbosch um, for the wine and also for the teaching and percussion. <laughs> So I'm, I just I just want to point out that I pronounced that right. Yeah, nice work. Yeah, yeah. See, Laurel, it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, well done, well done. I want to I want to see if Rob reacts to this question the same way Jason Honheim did, which is, what's the Met doing next? I wonder how Jason responded. I haven't I haven't checked out his episode. Um, what's your What's your next performance? Our next performance is Tristan uh, opening night. Um, I believe it's uh, September 20-something. Wow, you're infinitely more on top of it than, than he was. <laughs> yes, and yeah, but the difference is is that he'll have to play infinitely more than I will on that. <laughs> no, you guys remember he had to check the calendar all this bunch of times? He's, he said it was, a, it was a funny week with, yeah, different yeah. pieces of different Yeah, things. that was in like, Electra time, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and whatever happens in the middle of opera season, um, you can't be held accountable for what you say. Uh, <laughs> if you're, if you're in order, then there's no excuse. Um, you should know what's going on. But yeah, I understand. Also, he shares the season with um, another principal timpanist, so oh, okay. Duncan. So he might not be even playing on Tristan. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. He said Electra was one of his favorite. I, didn't he talk up Electra so much, you guys? Do you remember that? I don't remember that. Yeah, he did. Yeah. He, uh, he came in one day and he, he showed us this video of 
certain part of Electra played backwards and slowed down over another part of Electra. <laughs> and, and even last summer, he, because I was playing second timpani on Electra, and he emailed me this. Um, he called it a sneak preview of his Electra plan, which was the music overlaid with like all these yellow and pink highlights. Um, he basically had like it was like it was sort of like a, what I think of. Um, like a marching band choreography um, plan looks like, but it was just for him on his timpani. He was very excited and super nerding out about that piece, which I was too. I mean, just not to quite to the extent that he was. Um, That's how uh, Jason knows that Paul is dead. It's all the electric stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he he's probably found it out scientifically. So. <laughs> ben, Ben, you saw a question there from. Ted Jackson, that was pretty good. Yeah, I, I'd like to kind of start with a question from uh, Ted Jackson, who said, uh, would you talk about your schooling and how you developed a passion for orchestral playing? Um, yeah, that's for me? Yeah. Okay, um, sure. Yeah, well, let's see. Um, I pretty much decided I wanted to be an orchestra musician before I got to college, um, which was a good advantage for me because that helped decide my college choice. Um, I was, I was definitely, I definitely knew I wanted to do music, um, because out of all the things that I did, that was the least boring one, um, and I knew that it would be interesting to me as deep as I wanted to take it, so I knew I wanted to do music, but I didn't know which track, I kind of played rock, drum set, and I played, um, some marimba, and I was in this Celtic orchestra in my school, and some different things. And then I went to Interlochen, and I was studying with Keith and uh, Keith Aleo, who I know has been on this podcast. And um, and I learned there. Maybe it was from him, or maybe it was from somebody else there. I don't really remember. Um, but I learned that pretty much the performance avenue that you can go down, the career track you can go down, and have a salary and have a steady income and and benefit family and take you know have a normal life is is a union job with an orchestra. So and an added benefit is I can work really hard and there's a fair audition process which can earn me a job. Um, so for that reason I went into orchestra and it wasn't because I particularly like orchestra music better than other kinds of music. Um, and um, but I always thought I'm gonna do orchestra, I'm gonna I'm going to set my life up with orchestra, and I'm going to do something else that's interesting on the side. And at the time, I thought it was arranging and performing chamber music versions of progressive rock music, um, which, by all means, is a very noble thing to do. Um, and I have done that, but um, I've gone into some other things as my on-the-side thing. Um, but, yeah, and, and then my schooling uh, was based on finding a place where I could most likely get an orchestra job. Because I, um, I knew you know, that I wanted to be a well-rounded musician, but most importantly, I needed to get a job. Just absolutely needed to. Sure, sure. So, so a big part of it was, oh, this is a full-time thing that is permanent, definite, and uh, if you get it, it's secure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and all the benefits that come with it because of the union status. Yeah, great. S speaking of that, how do you how do you think it is going out there? You hear so much about people saying, "Well, orchestras are closing and jobs are dying, and it's so tough to land the gig, and it's so competitive." You you rub shoulders with a lot more orchestral players than than uh, people like myself do. So, what's what's your feel of it right now? Um. Yeah, good, good question. Um, let's see. So, you know how, like, when you're, um, well, when, when I was uh, growing up, my dad always played a lot of Frank Zappa music for me. And so I would, sometimes I remember I would ask him, what's your favorite song? And he, he would be listening to Don't Eat the Yellow Snow. And at that moment, he would say, Don't Eat the Yellow Snow is my favorite song. And another time we were listening to, um, you know, uh, um, Long Distance Runaround by Yes. And I would say, what's your favorite song? And he would say, well, Long Distance Runaround is my favorite song. I kind of feel like 
like um, people who don't know much about the orchestra industry have this idea that whatever's going on right then um, is the truth about the entire industry as a whole. Um, and they kind of have this, uh, this inability to see the bigger picture. And um, I was pretty involved in the recent Met Orchestra negotiations, um, the, the negotiations that the musicians and the management had, in that I set up the website and I had a lot to do with the social media and the blogging and all this stuff. Um, and so I had to think about this a lot. And there were a lot of people on the other side, the management side, who were saying, you know, opera is dead and classical music is dying and and they could point to some anecdotal evidence of you know we sold this many fewer tickets and then you know that other orchestra over there went out of business um, and then we came back with or the union came back with this ginormous list of the positive news in the orchestra industry which is um, you know so and so orchestra got a two million dollar donation more than they've ever gotten there's a new orchestra that just was created here. This other orchestra had a, you know, a positive um, uh, contract negotiation. And so it's, it's easy in, in a certain climate to just assume that it's always like that, right? Mm -hmm. But to me, if you look around in the United States, you have a whole bunch of amazing orchestras that have been going all for you know, decades or in some cases hundreds of years, um, they're still playing. Um, there are ebbs and flows in their uh, in their audience, in their artistic quality. At some points, you know, you hear of a certain orchestra really coming out of, among you know from the pack. Like the LA Phil right now is like the coolest place to be, and. Um, you know, you hear about their great salaries, and that you hear about their amazing dedication to new music. And Dudamel is hot right now. And then, uh, you know, and then another orchestra that you that sometimes is thought of as really good goes below. You know, um, and and really, those are all just very minor stories in the big story of uh, tons of tons of orchestras out there are playing at a high level, making great symphonic music for their communities and doing it sustainably and um, everything else is just minor little details on the way I think so, so, I have a question um, I, I guess it was, I think it was the past Super Bowl you were talking about LA Phil and I, I, I'm probably getting some details mixed up but basically uh, Gustavo Dudamel and the LA Youth Orchestra I think it was performed at the Super Bowl yeah, um, and they performed this big uh, like Coldplay show, and I don't I don't even think the kids were actually being heard. I think like they had pre-recorded it, and they were basically you know lip syncing to it. Um, and a lot of people were saying something along the lines of like, why like why can't the kids play real music? Why are they out on the field playing Coldplay like lip syncing Coldplay? Um, is that a in your mind? I mean, obviously it's making classical music relevant. We could say or something like that to youth. Is that a What's your opinion on that approach to it, I guess? Um, well, you might be asking the wrong person here because Coldplay is one of the bands that I've made arrangements of, and I love them, and I, I could go into detail about Viva La Vida and exactly how they use ninths and sevenths over the chords to make really interesting and kind of emotional feelings throughout the piece and I really like the lyrics I've studied the lyrics of that song um, I, I think uh, I don't remember the dude's name who is the front man of Coldplay but um, James Hetfield <laughs> I don't think so <laughs> it's uh, Chris Martin who also plays trumpet in Chicago My oh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> he has a great double career going <laughs> yeah I mean I think he's a, a really interesting songwriter um, I think when Yellow came out, um, I mean, I was in middle school a lot because I remember being in middle school gym class listening to it. Um, I think some of the things that he does with melody, I've never heard anyone else do or even come close to. It's really interesting. And, and he has that range with his falsetto um, that, he, that gives him this interesting advantage among male singers um, 
in a industry or in a sort of subgenre of rock music that not many people can really do that very well. Um, all that is to say, um, I think uh, all of that music is real music, and anybody who gets to play it is lucky, and it's it's really interesting. Um, and it's it's probably easier for students to get into that kind of music, but um, but even more than that, like I've never really accepted the premise that some kinds of music are more uh, um, legitimate than other kinds of music um, in terms of like us in classical music world accepting them as part of our kind of music or something like that. Um, because I mean, think about it. Uh, Viva La Vida has um, melody, harmony, rhythm, and it has orchestration. It has it has all the elements. They're just used differently, and they're used in some cases, I think, to elicit or to bring out more emotions than some of the music we think of as more legitimate. Um, and to me. Uh, to deliver an emotional experience through those elements, um, regardless of the genre, um, is a legitimate, you know, uh, mission in music, right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I have no, no problem with it. More power to them. Yeah, agree. I feel like that was one of the first points I would always make in my general music class, is don't feel, you know, th this class we're going to focus a lot on classical music, but don't get caught up in the vibe of classical music and I, I couldn't agree more and, and one of the things I always said was uh, these genres are very confusing I think there is crappy meaningless pop music and there's wonderful deep meaningful pop rock music yeah likewise with classical music there is just meaningless boring dribble and then there's some really heavy great mm -hmm. stuff and the genres um, is, a, is a way to categorize and catalog and label but it doesn't mean okay this is you know this is more likely to have meaningful heavy stuff and it drives me crazy when I'm talking to classical musicians and they they rip on rock music or pop music so they say oh well it's just like it's just four chords or two chords man that's so boring well, and I'm so thinking <laughs> well, and, I, and I think I, I hope you hear more than fancy chords in yeah. Beethoven I know I do there's a lot more than fancy chords going on there yeah. Um, so, man, like, I don't know, but I think something's wrong with their, their ears if that's all they're hearing. It's, it's funny because um, among classical musicians, um, I always, I think I'm much more accepting and interested in more of the pop side of things, and, the, um, and then I go talk to my uncle, who is a writer in Ro for Rolling Stone, um, and he, for, for, for him, I'm on. I like music that's on the very most complex and weird side of the spectrum, um, because his um, some of his, the music he loves are like the Ramones and um, you know Michael Jackson and um, and so to him these songs that I these the music that I like you know even if it's like a ten minute fish song or something like that is like on the very most uh, weird niche outer edges of what, what uh, he considers, you know, um, standard, like, you know, pop fare, I guess. Yeah, sure. You mentioned prog rock a lot. Are you into Yes and and, uh, and Dream yeah. Theater? I, I don't know Dream Theater as much, but I grew up on a steady diet of Yes, King Crimson, Genesis, Old oh. Genesis specifically, um, when Peter Gabriel was still around. Um, and uh, let's see. What else? Uh, ben just wrote, oh, oh, God, Laurel, they're about to lose us. <laughs> <laughs> what about Rush? Rush, too, yeah. I, I, think, uh, I think the bands that I loved the most um, stopped making good music in, like, 1977, and Rush was more of an 80s band, and so I liked them a lot. Um, but uh, Game of Thrones, I, I, I can't go there. You guys can, you guys can go there. <laughs> Uh, we're we're t saying secret things in the chat here. It's usually it's Laura and I for sure, and it's usually the guests. But yeah, Ben dreads every time I <laughs> talk about 
or mention Game of Thrones. Speaking of Ben, we need hold on. We need to figure out like for one of these, we need to actually have like the the chat displayed on screen for people to view because there's usually some pretty good inappropriate stuff in there. Usually <laughs> <laughs> some pretty good inappropriate stuff. Yeah. <laughs> there've been some. There, yeah, there've been some. There've been some PG thirteen ones for sure. Um, yeah. Ben, you want to talk about your historical topic? Yeah, so uh, we're talking a lot about winning orchestra do jobs and teachers and all, and I thought, what what better person to talk about really than Alan Abel um, in this context? And actually, this wasn't in my notes, but I remember reading it. Rob was talking about taking uh, orchestra auditions, and Alan Abel said that when he auditioned for... Actually, I'll ask you, how many people do you think auditioned for Philadelphia Orchestra when Alan Abel did? Oh, I don't know. Back in... What year was that, like... 1963 or something like that. 59, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't know. Six. Four. Four. Okay. Oh, that was my guess. I wanted to guess. <laughs> it was it yeah, it was uh, it was Alan Abel, John Beck, um, Fred Wickstrom, who taught at University of Miami, and he said someone else local. He didn't he didn't give the name, but yeah, it really shows the way that the game has changed because he said today at least 70 people would show up to take that audition, if not significantly more than that. Oh, yeah. um, and one of the most impressive things about Alan Abel to me is that um, my teacher at Miami, Svet Stoyanov, said that he said that if Mr. if Mr. Abel came to take his audition today, he would win his job back. That's like that's how good he is. Um, yeah, I don't anyway, know. Yeah. Um, yeah, but little biographical information about Alan Abel. He was born in 1929. He's still with us today. Uh, he was raised in Hobart, Indiana. Um, and he came from a musical family. Uh, I think he said he had a toy drum that he wore out by the age he was five, and he began like formally studying drums at age seven. His teachers uh, included Clarence Carlson and Haskell Har, and then he studied with Bill Street at Eastman, who was John Beck's predecessor at Eastman. Um, he was at Eastman from 1947 to 1951, and that whole duration he was also performing part-time with the Rochester Phil. When he graduated Eastman, he spent two and a half years playing the Empire Band of the U.S. Air Force in Geneva Audition, uh, sorry, Geneva, New York. Um, and then um, after that, he became the principal percussionist of the Oklahoma Symphony from 1953 to 1959. While he was playing in Oklahoma, um, Stokowski came and guest conducted Oklahoma. Um, and he was very, they were doing Shostakovich 10. He was very impressed by the piccolo player and the snare drummer, who was Alan Abel. So in a, a newspaper you know, write-up about it, he mentioned these two people, um, and Alan Abel clipped the newspaper thing and sent a letter to the Philadelphia Orchestra, um, and it, I guess specifically to Charlie Owens, saying, if there's ever an opening, here's Sikowski's opinion of me, can you please call me to come audition? So shortly thereafter, um, Charlie Owen retired from uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra, Alan Abel went. As I said, he auditioned against four people, and he won the job. Um, he spent 38 years as a full-time percussionist with the Philadelphia Orchestra, and t including 25 as the associate principal percussionist. Um, and his colleagues that he overlapped careers with in the Philadelphia Orchestra were Fred Hinger, Charlie Owen, Michael Bookspan, Jerry Carlos, Tony Orlando, and Don Liu Liuzzi. Um, and then in addition to playing in the Philadelphia Orchestra, he, he for his entire performance career was very passionate about teaching students and kind of passing on the tradition. So he taught at University of Oklahoma, Oklahoma City University, Glassboro State College, Temple University, which is probably the big one most of us know, and Settlement Music School. Um, and as kind of a testament to his teaching, Don Liuzzi said that nearly one-third of all professional orchestral percussionists in the U.S. have been influenced by Alan Abel either directly or as students of his students. Um, his former students perform in the Boston, Chicago, Columbus, Detroit, Houston, Los Angeles, Metropolitan Opera, and Philadelphia Orchestras, just to name a few. And his former students also teach or have taught at Curtis, Juilliard, New England Conservatory, Rice, Temple, Michigan, and Miami. Again, just to name a few. Um, Alan Abel has also been involved in instrument design. He designed three different triangle models, um, and he also created the first suspended concert bass drum stands in the U.S., which are probably what most of us know with, like, the bass drum and a metal ring with some sort of rubber bands or straps suspending it, um, which he said he discovered that design by accident. He and Fred Hanger were moving a bass drum, and he 
tapped on the bass drum and noticed how freely it resonated and from there designed a stand on that principle. Um, and then uh, he was inducted into the PAS Hall of Fame in 1998 and my favorite kind of quote about him is actually from Bob Becker. Bob Becker called Alan Abel the god of the bass drum uh, and they performed Mudra together on, in November 2014 on Alan Abel's 85th birthday concert with Abel on the bass drum part and Bob Becker on the snare drum part. Um, and I wanted to give a special shout out to a, a friend of mine named Tom Bowden who actually uh, just this past semester completed his dissertation on Alan Abel um, and the kind of Philadelphia Orchestra School of Orchestra playing. Um, and Tom is hoping to write a book um, so his dissertation is currently embargoed. It's not publicly available yet. Um, but really, really good information. A lot of interviews with Alan Abel and Don Lewitsey and some others in that document. So check it out whenever it becomes available. Wow, way to go, Ben. I'm, st I'm still stuck on four people auditioned for that gig. Yeah. Is that crazy? One, one other interesting thing about it is that uh, Abel, I think, also at the time won the Rochester Philharmonic job, and they asked him to do that and teach at Eastman, and he turned them down for Philadelphia, and then John Beck took the, the other oh. job, so to speak. So those two are the same vintage. It's very cool that um, what you mentioned about Sped saying that Abel would win back his job. Yeah. Now I feel like it's um, yeah, it's very easy to be a little ageist about things, but it's like that's legit. That's yeah. Well, when you when you look at you know I, I hate to use the word older players, but when you look at the AARP generation of players, as Nancy Zeltzman's called them, <laughs> they're they're <laughs> the the types that have maintained themselves well and the types that have kind of gone by the wayside compared to the younger generation um, and Alan Abel I think is definitely in the former category. Oh yeah, well I, yeah, I mean you have life and you have kids and then you have grandkids and yeah. I don't know how much my body I practice <laughs> like, and four grandkids. Then you have to have kids though and I don't know. But anyway, sorry. We have, yeah, we have a hard enough time with the cat. Rob, you have... <laughs> oh, the cat. <laughs> you you have some wonderful resources, and it seems like in the last uh, couple of years you've been really dedicated to blogging. And if I could find from your, uh, let's see, from your website, I saw you said I have a you said something. I want to paraphrase to the effect of I have a wonderful job, and I think any one of you can also have a job like mine. Can you? Can you can you elaborate a little bit on ha all these wonderful materials you're making on auditioning and I, hopefully that kind of leads us into the whole Dale Clues project? Um, yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so um, I started my job in 2011. Um, I immediately had this major void in my life, right? So I was sort of working on auditions to an obsessed level, um, possibly unhealthy, but uh, then, um, you know, and I had sort of developed my entire uh, focus and lifestyle around auditioning and practicing um, and taking auditions and um, trying to manage my time around that. And then suddenly this giant project that I was... Uh, fully focused on was just gone. Um, and, um, and it was a little confusing. I mean, I don't know, uh, um, Ben, you, you said you're changing jobs right now, and Casey, I know you have a good job. I don't know if you guys have felt this way, but um, have, you, have you ever gotten to a point where you, you, uh, you've, you've, come up, you've come to an achievement and then you kind of have the opportunity to take a step back and take stock and figure out what is next, what you have, what you have to do next. That will that be this summer in a nutshell for me. Yeah. Really. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, and you're starting at a new school, right? So obviously, there's some, um, you know, getting to know the students or getting to know the the instruments or, you know, what the deal is there and instituting all of your new curriculums. I don't know what, I have no idea. I'm just yeah, yeah. talking. Yeah, in short, yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, 
you know, and then, but then there's that, that feeling of like, you know, you were, you kind of have the potential to do something. You have time and energy to do something else. Um, and you're not exactly sure what the best thing, the best possible use of your time, the best way you can make an impact on, you know, the world or people or, you know, percussion world or just the world in general. Um, I kind of felt like that as soon as I got my job. I, I didn't know exactly um, what I should do next because I kind of had um, crossed the threshold of I don't really need to, to think about auditions anymore. Um, and and so I, I spent a couple of years like, um, I wouldn't call it floundering. Um, I would I would, some of the things that I kind of dipped my toes into were photography, songwriting. Um, I, I started playing in three bands in like Brooklyn and um, and uh, I did some interesting things. Um, I took some online music production classes. Um, I didn't really know where all of those things were heading. I just knew I was interested in them. And I knew that I had the potential to use my time to do something kind of important. And I also had this advantage of a lot of people who start playing in a big orchestra, get asked to teach, and then they start using, that starts taking up their time. And of course, teaching is one way that you can make a huge impact on people, you know, um, and it's fulfilling. So, but I hadn't been asked, you know, um, I hadn't been asked. I started sort of collecting private students, um, but uh, I didn't really know what to do. And, and I started just diving into, like, I have this sort of obsess obsession uh, lifestyle where whatever I'm interested in, I just completely dive headfirst into that. Um, and I, I think I'm probably not alone in, in orchestra world. Um, you don't have to be obsessed, have an obsessed lifestyle to get an orchestra job, and it helps because you can, uh, you know, put your head down and, and um, go straight towards something. But um, so, so if I can just try to try to process and summarize, you're, you're trying to win an orchestra job and you're running 120% with your audition material, your De La Cluse etude, and then all of a sudden you get the job and it's like, wait, what do I do with all of that work? Because now, now, I, now I play the real gig and that's a new, new project, but what do I do with this 120% full speed I've been running at for years? Is that right? right. Exactly. So I had this back to up uh, like just storage of information and thoughts sort of like in my head, in my brain somewhere tucked away and I had all this time and energy and so at a certain point I realized and it was this one day in uh, I think it was September of 2013 I was like oh my god I can put together all of the skills I've made so far and do something that no one has ever done and I can do it in a new way that no one's ever done something, you know. So I, I made this plan for myself to learn all 12 etudes of the Del um, uh, uh book. And um, I, I sort of, I realized that I can, I can market, I can record that album, uh, which is something that has always sort of occurred to me as not just fulfilling for me, but super useful and um, valuable for students who are like me, but 10 years ago, for instance. Because, like, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but, like, when I'm, when I'm, when I was 16, I was studying the Della Clues, I had, I had the best teachers, like, anyone could ask for. But I was always wondering, like, you know, how does the percussionist in San Francisco play this? How does the percussionist in the New York Phil play this? Um, but really, that wasn't available to me at the time. Um, I wish that I would have had more information. Um, and uh, I was playing it for my teachers. Um, but I wish I would have had just a ton more information, um, just sort of the way you can listen to, like, 10 recordings of Beethoven 5 and study it. Mm -hmm. So I thought I, I had this kind of fear on one hand of, what if I record this and then everyone says it's the wrong way to play it? Um, or what if I don't play it in the official Delacruz way? Or, or, you know, somebody comes out of the woodwork and says, you know, well, you're supposed to shape it differently and blah, blah, blah. And then I realize, wait a minute. Like, 
if anybody has authority on this, then I have at least a measure of authority sort of comparable to that person. The only people I don't really have authority on that type of music over is, you know, the original sources, like the, like Delaclues and the students he wrote his music for, his mm -hmm. students. Uh, but we have already developed a completely different way of playing it from them. So we have this, you know, um, and I don't even really want to say it like this, but we have this American, more American style of playing um, those pieces, and it's already uh, diverged from the original ways that it was um, played, you know, when they were first written. Um, and then, I, so, I kind of thought, okay, not only am I going to play this, I'm going to play it so that people in all corners of the world can, can at least hear another version. I'm not saying I'm going to give them the definitive version, um, although maybe on, the, on my website I do use that word in some of the marketing. But all I'm going to say is this is a, another version for you. And this is how some guy who won an audition at the Met plays it. Um, and not only... Sorry, it, go ahead. It's certainly safe to say that, I, I, I mean, I think the community would consider it the definitive version. It's the first and only comprehensive, professionally produced recording out there, right? I think so, yeah, at, at least at this point. Um, and I always thought, you know, maybe if I record it, then I'll inspire other percussionists in other parts of the country or the world to record it also. Um, so far, that hasn't happened. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Um, maybe, you know, may, I always think of it as um, even though no one has done it yet, it doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. It just means that no one has done it yet, you know. So um, I want, you know, I wanted to do it the first time. I also felt like there's kind of this lack, of this dearth of information having to do with Delacruz in, in our community, right? I've, I've never seen an interview with Delacluse except for one interview with Frederick Macarez, which was really interesting. Um, but really, like, I had the picture on the back of the Delacluse books of Delacluse burned into my brain, and then that's basically it. Um, so I got in contact with um, a friend of mine, G. Bay Leclerc, uh, who lives, who's in the Paris Opera, and that's also where Delacluse played. And I did this trip around France where I went from, you know, person to person interviewing different people about Delacluse. Um, and then I, it ended with me um, actually being able to make a last-minute um, uh, random trip into the south of France to interview Delacluse himself, um, which was amazing. But, like, you know, it's 2016. It shouldn't be that amazing to just go and interview someone. But it... it it was a situation in which I think it's a cultural thing or maybe just a historical thing. Um, um, there's a lot of feeling of privacy and, and ex maybe it's exclusivity or just um, I think a lot of people would say it's, it's respect um, in a way where you, you don't um, go and publicly, um, you know, interview someone or, or you know, some information is meant for that teacher and their students only. And I think I grew up with a lot of that. I felt that when I was in school, um, where you're taking lessons with someone and you're not supposed to take lessons with another person. And I just reject that. Um, I think that the more information, and I think it's my personality too, I think the more information I can get, the better choices I can make. And um, and so I always want, I wanted to, um, if I'm able to have a position at the Met, um, and I can essentially be a, a leader, I feel like I should use that position for good and to do things that I believe in, and that's one of them. And so I, I wanted to go and interview somebody um, and, and bring a perspective of Delacluse and French percussion playing that has really not made its way, its way to the United States and the rest of the world. Um, and looking back on it, um, it the... the um, the response has been largely, you know, almost ninety, you know, ninety-nine percent positive, um, and and the fear that I had that some people wouldn't um, accept what I was doing or my new way of looking at the world and um, using digital media to advance percussion, um, you know, there's there were some people who are definitely fully against it, and I so I ran into those people too. Um, you know, and so it was just interesting. But I, I really believe in, you know, 
what I did, and I, I get emails from people, you know, saying, saying, you know, asking me to do more, and so I'm going to keep doing it, you know. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Yeah. That's cool. So, so, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, it's Laura. A very interesting. Thanks. Yeah, but it's a like this idea of sharing of learning is really really cool and really interesting and and you know what you were saying about certain teachers were a little almost territorial or something or we thought they were or we had this idea that that's how it was supposed to be and maybe it's not now but um, you know in my accompanist adventures it's interesting to talk to different teachers professionals and students and how I think other instruments are incredibly territorial um, like it's it's not rare to meet a vocalist who isn't allowed to study with anyone else, for yeah. example. And territorial um, is a good word for that. I should have thought of that. It's exactly right. Yeah, it's weird, and and you get into you know those of us that decide to share what we have found through our own research and sort of method of discovery. You'll meet people who start to talk about intellectual property. I don't know if you've encountered those people or not. Um, but then there's talk about, well, you're just putting all your information out there. Why would they try to study with you? Why would they then seek you out? Um, I've met with that a little bit. And then um, just to kind of take it a little different way in terms of, you know, a student studying with one teacher, it's not totally rare that Casey will get an email from someone um, that he maybe does or doesn't know. And it's pedagogical questions about, playing and studying, but these they're at a school already, and they have a teacher, or it's like, I'm trying to play your piece. How do you play it? Like, <laughs> what? What do you mean? <laughs> the um, vagueness that's really difficult, yeah. Yeah, but, but, you know, there's part of me that's like, hold on, you know, don't send him 20 emails. Maybe just try to study with him. If it sounds like you actually just want to study with a certain person. Um, I'm not totally sure where I was going with that whole smorgasbord of well, comments, but no, I mean, I, I totally, I get what you're saying, and I agree. Um, logically, if you give away what you know, then people already know what you know, and they don't have to pay you for what you know, right? Um, but I kind of look at it in a different way. Um, I sort of have this mindset of, um, um, well, not only generosity, but um, I'm not exactly sure how to describe it, but um, if you've been studying something for 10 or 15 years, and after writing a few blogs about it, you've exhausted the things that you've ever th known or thought about, then I don't think you did a very good job studying. You know? <laughs> I agree um, very much, yeah. <laughs> I think I've written about 60 or 70 blogs total at this point. I think I could write blogs every week for the rest of my life and there would still be like more random stuff that just came up all the time. It's like, it's it's not like I know a finite amount of things. It's like I've thought about a whole bunch of things in different ways and I can, I can express them differently and they're all, like any given blog I write about, I can go through and every paragraph can itself be fleshed into its own blog. And like, and all of that is so generic that it can never be specifically applied to any one student. And even if somebody reads all the blogs that are in the past and in the future for me, it still wouldn't be personalized for them, and it still wouldn't be me teaching them based on their specific um, playing or, you know, uh, history. Um, it'll never be, you know, it'll, what, what I do is never going to replace private teaching one-on-one, -on -one, um, and nobody's ever going to get as much out of it if they just read my blog, but I, but the people that I'm write, writing my blog for are, or in my ideal world, studying with somebody and learning my stuff as a supplemental thing on the side that will just add to their ability to become a virtuoso percussionist. You know? Well, I think uh, likewise, like, like another portion of this is that everything that you know is partially stuff that you've created. Um, like, or everything that anyone on here knows, like, it's, you know, an amalgamation of all this stuff from your teachers, plus you, and if you really wanted, like, you know, if that wasn't true, if you really wanted to be as good as Rob Knopper, you would just go study with Rob Knopper's teachers, not Rob, yeah. um, which, you know, obviously 
to try and be as good as someone is you know, very subjective and weird. Um, <laughs> I think the point stands that we, anyone that has knowledge doesn't, it's not like just book knowledge, it's, you know, experience combined to, to create something new or unique or something like that. Well, and, and I guess I would just add it's, if it was anything like the sciences, you put the information out there and you spread it around to as many people as possible and then other people build on it and the field progresses. So, yeah, I, I agree. The, the longer you bottle stuff up and don't share it, the slower the progress will be. So, and of course, percussion is one of those fields where we're saying, oh, it's such an exciting time to be a percussionist and look at all the progress we're having. Uh, case in point, I was going to do, I think the next episode I'll have this together, but this whole acoustic levitation thing, these scientists get these sound plates and they send a sound wave that reflects and it creates what's called a standing wave and they can levitate things. They can levitate stuff with uh, moving sound plates. And in the 70s, the, um, the sound plates were stationary and the objects were stationary. So you like, you know, drop some sand and the sand particles float. But now they can actually move them and it is three-dimensional. They can uh, move a whole array of these sound plates all around. And in the beginning, yeah, of course, they had no idea what this application would be, but they're thinking in the future this could be used to move dangerous materials from one spot to another, or it could even have simple office applications like, oh, my pencil is over there, click, and something like moves to you. So I don't know, again, like something, just putting it out there, letting other people build on what you're doing, it's going to progress the field. Yeah. I don't know who it really helps to keep it bottled up either. It doesn't help you. Does it help your students maybe to give them an advantage over other students? Yeah, I, I think that's what pe the, the the group of people Laurel's mentioning, I think they're saying, no, don't give it away for free. Do it at your festival or your seminar so that they have to pay for it. And I guess, yeah, the person that helps is you, the person who knows the information, because you're going to make some, some cash. But, yeah, I, I agree. It's like, man, kind of... Well, cash is good, too. I think I, I think there's nothing wrong with wanting to earn cash as a teacher and even if you're doing it online. Um, uh, one of my goals with setting up my online blog and, and courses is to, is to show that it can be a, monet, a monetizable profession to blog and sell courses, you know, online courses. And yeah. I want to I prove the concept by making courses and making money out of it. I think, I think you can <laughs> be a, a profitable teacher and make an impact on the world in a non-traditional, non-one-on-one kind of way. I think that's fine, too. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ben, why don't you shoot him a Facebook question there? Yeah, so we're, we're talking a lot about auditions. Um, let's talk about what happens after you get the audition. There are a couple kind of uh, similar questions, but there was one from Eli Garris chat, I guess is how you say it. He said, it's one thing to win a job, but what was it like when you stepped into your first rehearsal with the Met? Can you tell us a little about this first experience and how those early rehearsals helped shape how you perform with the ensemble today? Um, yeah. So I'll talk about two rehearsals that I had that were uh, illuminating. There, there was the first one, which what we were playing Anna Belena, which is just a terrible, terrible, terrible piece. Um, and uh, the second one is Madam Butterfly, obviously an outrageous masterpiece. So people who have gone to their first rehearsal after winning a job know this feeling where you have spent like just, a, just an uh, indescribable amount of energy and time working on this audition. And then um, to go into that situation where you're not really sure what to expect, but you're joining a professional orchestra and you kind of you have this idea that it's that it's the most amazing thing that it's it's going to be even harder than anything else you've ever done and it's going to be a constant challenge so when I went to, into my first rehearsal and we were playing Anna Bolena um, of course it was just a bad piece I mean there's no other way to say it um, it's by Donizetti and it's one of Donizetti's Donizetti is a boring composer. I think nobody can disagree with that. Elixir of Love is amazing. Yeah, he's written some pieces that somehow um, um, 
have made it into the standard repertoire because he doesn't do the things that are so terrible about what he does, like repeat annoying phrases over and over and over. And Elixir of Love is is one of his short pieces. He he like packed it with the best of his melodies, and he didn't put any like long-winded fluff in there. And it's basically standable. And the good thing about it is that the singing can be unbelievable. Like, you know, given the opportunity, a great singer can do something awesome with it. Um, but it's like when you get into a composer's lesser-known stuff, especially from the 1800s, you know, when it really should have been forgotten, but it, like, somehow got dug up. And anyway, the orchestra sounded like they felt the same way about this piece that I felt about it. But, of course, I studied the hell out of this piece. I, like, I knew... I only played in the overture and, like, two other movements or something like that. But I knew what every single other instrument was doing. I knew exactly the length and the tone of the crashes that I was going to do. I knew exactly when I was going to muffle, when I was going to half muffle. I knew, you know, the articulation I was going to tend towards legato or staccato. And, like, I had it all planned out. And I got there, and um, I was surprised to learn that... In a professional orchestra, I had worked harder learning this piece that the orchestra had never played before than anyone else in the orchestra. I knew by far. Um, and um, I think it, it was an advantage that I only had to learn three movements rather than nearly four hours of inane terribleness. Um, but anyway, yeah, it was kind of a shock. Like, um, I, I knew the music better, but I also knew the style worse. Like, the orchestra fell in line and was able to gel in a way that I had never experienced in or like an orchestra doing, because I'd only played with youth orchestras, including New World Symphony, I'd say. Um, and they just kind of gelled into the style, and, like, decisions that I had made about how long to hold cymbal crashes for um, turned out not to be right, because in that style, I, you know... Um, the tradition at the Met would be to hold a certain type of note out, and they, they knew exactly how it should feel. Um, anyway, so that was the first um, kind of illuminating thing. Um, and then the second one was uh, a rehearsal that I did with, uh, for Madame Butterfly with Placido Domingo conducting. Um, and um, Placido Domingo is a singer, and more recently he's... A conductor also, and I know he conducts at a lot of orchestras. Like he is the music director, I think, in Washington National Opera, maybe. Um, anyway, um, so he was conducting, and, and Madame Butterfly has all of these really historical, traditional rubatos. Right, there will be a note that looks like an eighth note, and it should be an eighth note, but in fact, it lasts as long as three eighth notes or something like that. And I was playing the the gong part, and um, and there was, I remember there being a measure of, um, a measure of three, four, and this measure of three, four, it was like one, two, da, 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 and three, da, 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 one. And I had played like yeah. three or four times in, in that, like getting ready for the downbeat. I had thought that the downbeat <laughs> already happened like three or four times. And the whole trumpet <laughs> section was snickering at me. And, um, and I think, yeah, getting getting used to that and playing late with the conductor and just all of the, you know, that kind of piece is so historical and traditional with the Met that all those little rubatos are... Everybody knows that a first year at the Met just cannot go through a whole season without coming in wrong a few times because of that exact thing. And we just kind of uh, eventually start to internalize all of these, um, you know, styles based on Puccini or Verdi or, like I said, Donizetti, stuff like that. You know, if, if I could just pull that out a little further, the uh, conducting example you just did, um, <laughs> it, it seems like any time I'm around uh, any percussion clinic, seminar, in fact, this, this thing we just did with Ted Agcats and Sean Tilburg, up at the Snowpawn Music Festival in Maine, 
time is always such a thing, and you have to play perfectly in time. And, and I'm a fan of that. I think that's great. I, I strive to do that. Um, but I know that a lot of violinists, a lot of singers, a lot of conductors, they, they maybe have the right feel. They don't have that time like we're always striving to have. Um, so I don't know, like, why is it such a big deal for us? And then you get in context, and I've heard it before. I've heard great orchestras, and the drummers are playing in perfect time, and they end up away from where the orchestra is. And it's like, okay, you need to know how to play in time, but you also need to know how to, like, hang. You know, like, <laughs> so I don't know. Do you think we focus too much on you got to have perfect strict time? Um, I think maybe what we focus on about getting perfect time is more mathematical than it is realistic. Because um, for me, perfect time means coming in exactly with the clarinet after knowing how long they're going to breathe. Like, if, you know, there's a note, if there's a note and the conductor, you know, like at the end of Boehm, for instance, it's just a downbeat on four four bars and everybody plays together. But the conductor puts his beat down, and then it just you just know that it's going to be a few seconds until you play. Now, now that's knowing um, how to hang. Um, yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah, that's like a, a drummer that can play in time but just can't stay with the bass player. That dude doesn't know how to hang right. uh, but can play in perfect metronom metronomic time. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would say if you're insisting on playing perfectly metronomic and none of the rest of the orchestra is going to do that, and then you end up wrong, then you are objectively wrong, and you, sure. don't have, you don't have good time. You know, your, your time is based on the, circum, the, the circumstance and the other people there. Um, the conductor, how long it takes other instruments to... And, and I find a lot of times we have, have it the, some of the hardest because we have to play rhythmically through the bars where most people can just let notes uh, hang until the next downbeat. But for us, um, we might have a rhythm. And so we have to find perfect ways of allowing the time to stretch and choosing exactly where our rhythms go. And it can't have anything, you know, it, it, you're, you're using the influence of math, you know, and metronomic correctness, um, but you're also... Um, setting setting up time for other the, what you know is is actually going to be the real you know beats for the orchestra. I think one one word we're hitting at talking about time a lot is like mathematical. It's mathematically in time or whatever. Um, and we as percussionists we love to harp on other instruments for oh that violinist his time wasn't you know whatever like and I think it is a very important thing. But I think one thing that so many other instruments do that we don't do enough is listen. Um, I was, as you can probably imagine, a somewhat unusual child. Uh, but I remember in, in, in high school, I, I like for fun, I listened to Keiko Abe and Evelyn Glennie recordings, because that's the kind of music I was into. Um, and I never really thought it was strange until I went to college and people were saying, like, oh, I don't want to listen to percussion recordings. And it's like, well, then why, why do you want to play it? And why do I want to listen to you play it if you don't enjoy how it sounds? So I think that, yeah, listening is such a key component. Like, every violinist listens to recordings of Brahms all the time. And if you go to play one of Keiko Abe pieces and you don't know what she sounds like, or De La Cluse, or something, obviously we don't have a recording of De La Cluse, but if you don't know what these things are supposed to sound like, you know, you can stick a metronome on, but I don't think that, you know, the metronome applies the same way to Beethoven as it does to De La Cluse or Tchaikovsky, you know? Well, and and I guess and I guess I'm saying if, I feel like we prepare for auditions one way and you prepare for the real thing in another way and correct correct you know Rob is the expert here but it seems like the audition process is much more on the perfect time than the yes I can hang like how do they bet this person can hang and we hear about it so and so wins the job so and so didn't get tenure and you maybe hear little whispers of yeah they couldn't play with the band you know yeah. Um, so, so I don't know. Yeah, it's, it seems like the, the training uh, wins the audition, but maybe doesn't teach you yeah, the yeah. thing Rob is describing and that I'm calling hanging with the group. Well, and like speaking, uh, talking about listening more, like I remember in college, 
after concerts, I would always go and get the recording of the concert. And I, in fact, I still have all these like recordings of me playing in UNT bands um, in my iTunes library. Um, but there's one recording. I don't want to name any names or anything like that. But the xylophone player is consistently perfectly in time, one sixteenth note behind the ensemble. <laughs> and it's like, well, how? Like, I couldn't do that if I tried. But like, your time was so good, but your ears were so bad that that's what you did, you know. No, that's that's what I've heard too. I've I've heard a a, a very reputable university great orchestra play Scheherazade, and when the excerpt section snare drum came up, um, da da di da 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 da, when that part came up, Never yep, they started perfectly and then stayed perfect, and everyone went everywhere else. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I know what you mean. I think yeah, that was uh, when when I was in high school. I was doing that Celtic orchestra. I was playing in show choir. I played in bands. And at some point, I went to my teacher, uh, Brian Jones, who used to be in the Detroit Symphony, and I said, I'm getting serious now. It's time to quit all that stuff, right? And he said, no, 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 no. That is going to help you and give you an advantage when you get to those performing situations later. Because right now, you're learning and internalizing what it actually is to play with other people. And you're getting used to adjusting as you play and and I couldn't agree more with with him um, about how important that is in turn and it, and it does apply to auditions it's not like auditions is a place where you can forget about what it's like for other people when you know at auditions you're playing for people who are going to be uh, playing with you and they need to hear in your playing that you you understand um, that sometimes a phrase doesn't end metronomically metronomically and and there are some excerpts that are known to us you know and traditional where you you play with the time a little bit and, and it's not because it's wrong it's that it's that the time feels right to not be mathematical yeah yeah for sure uh, just like a real quick example of this I think that would perfectly sum up what we're talking about is like the first movement of Moonlight Sonata the, like the one that everyone knows the melody is written as dotted eighth, sixteenth, but the accompaniment is in triplets, and any percussionist would be getting out like the protractor and the room <laughs> trying to figure out where that note goes. I like no pianist has ever done that. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah, that's how I play that with protractors <laughs> every winter. Yeah. This is an interesting conversation about time and listening and um, like being an accompanist, it's been cool to be a percussionist first, and in some ways it really helps me. And it makes me not better than the trained pianists who are accompanists, but it's like they don't have to worry about me changing the time on them because my, you know, our training is very much don't do that. If you know you're not supposed to, don't and do everything you can to keep it steady. Um, but then on the flip side, you know, working with singers and instrumentalists who need to breathe. Like, that was really wacky at first to get used to looking at the page. There's nothing there. You know, I might know the phrase needs to do this, but, you know, you know, you need to add half a beat, or you need to just randomly stop for a minute and wait for them to breathe and then go on, even though in my mind the phrase doesn't stop because I don't have to breathe, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I yeah, feel like... it's, it's been interesting. Like, that, um, sorry, yeah, that experience... It's, I feel like I, I play, you know, whenever I do adaptations or something on marimba, I play them better now because I have an understanding of that. It's made that a more flexible part of playing for me. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was just trying to think of the students who are watching this and who are thinking to themselves, so a metronome is wrong, so how do I work on that? Like, what do I do? <laughs> and um, I was just thinking, like, you know, one thing that I, I have done to get used to this is like, for instance, if I'm learning Bach, right? Bach is almost never played in time when played by violinists. Sometimes it's played in time when played by percussionists. Um, but people who are, who understand Bach feel like it's weird when that happens. Um, when, when you're trying to work out a rubato that feels just right, um, it's almost like how you know, if you're if you're tuning a note among a bunch of woodwinds, 
um, or if you're you know playing a solo ab among a bunch of you know in the orchestra. Sometimes people play with the intonation and they try to come up a little bit. They just try to nudge up a little bit on the sharp side in order to sound to to show a color, you know, or to show almost to bring attention to the fact that they're playing a note and project. But um, you know, you can use uh, subtle manipulations of intonation to show different feelings through the music, and it's it almost works the same with time. You know, um, if you add more um, space at the end of you know getting to the end of a measure. You almost make someone lean in more and say, "Oh, they've been playing in time the past three measures, and now they're making me wait for this. What is this emotion I'm feeling suddenly?" Um, and I would say, like, if I was teaching this or whatever, and you know, I, or if I was trying to work on this, um, it, it's not something that you just add a sixteenth note worth of time at the end of the measure. It's something where you try like a thousand things and record yourself doing it and you finally settle on something that sounds a little bit more natural than playing it in time, you know, exactly in time. Hey, Rob. Yes. Can, can you tell us about Audition Talk Episode 1? Oh yeah, um, Audition. Right? Yeah, um, so this summer Due to my excellent um, couple weeks of freedom and another few weeks of freedom near the end of the summer, I'm I'm starting a couple new um, um, series, types of series, types of blogs. I mean, I have the blog, which has been about auditions and percussion, but I want to do more video stuff and I want to do some live stuff. So I'm starting two new things, um, and by the time this comes out, uh, both of them will have been announced. I already have done... Audition Talk, which was a live um, interview that I did with Jeremy at Principal Tempest of the Detroit Symphony. I did the interview with him um, three days after they finished picking their new percussionist, um, who is Jay Ritchie, who is just an awesome guy. I've known him since he was in school in New York. Um, and, um, and he won that audition, and, and then Jeremy and I got together and we talked about... Um, um, we talked about how Jeremy led up to his Detroit audition that he won. It was the 25th audition that he took. Um, and, uh, and then we talked about how his experience as an auditioner, as a candidate, affected his um, project of planning the audition, you know, for the percussionist, that, uh, the percussion audition that they had. So we talked about that, and it was awesome. The, the live uh, interviews are so cool because... Um, Questions and answers bring on more questions from students, and then we can go down a path uh, that we might not have gone down, down if it was just us. Um, and that interactivity is really awesome. So there's that, which is Audition Talk, um, which you can go check out at robnopper.com slash audition talk. And then I'm starting a new series called Percussion Hacker Studio Class. And I really think of this as, um, you know, at, I told you guys about how... Um, I've been, you know, using the blog as a teaching platform, right? And I've kind of, I do have some private students, but I kind of like shy away from doing too much one-on-one -on -one stuff because when I do a blog or a video, I can, um, I can have a much broader impact. I can have 5,000 people read a five-minute blog instead of one person experience a one-hour lesson, or whatever. And so I kind of think of my website readers as my casual students, um, and it's sort of my uh, casual studio. It's not like a studio like you guys have, um, where you have like, you know, a certain number of students who are dedicated and moved there for you, um, but these are people who spend, you know, five, ten minutes reading something that I, I make every week, and, and so I, I wanted to have my own studio class. So this is a place where um, I'm, I upcoming or potentially episodes that have already happened because I'm not exactly sure of the timing are going to be um, things like um, instructions for people, how to choose mallets for excerpts, um, exercises for four-stroke roughs, um, how to play soft snare drum, how to practice soft snare drum rolls, um, how to develop an audition day snare drum warm-up, 
um, things like that. And so the idea is it's like studio class. I'm, I'm teaching about a subject to the studio, which happens to be very big, and but I only teach for very short amounts of time. So um, people can um, check that out at robnopper.com slash studio class. And that, unlike audition talk, that one is percussion specific. Um, so that is just for percussionists um, talking about nerdy percussion and orchestra things, um, and uh, yeah. So, so Rob, something something you said made me think about a, a recent topic that we've had come up, um, and uh, we talk about so and so took twenty auditions before they won their job or whatever. And like recently with me, I I kept track of all the college teaching jobs I applied to. Yeah. Um, and then I went back and like researched who got the job, what did they have over me, or whatever. Did you? How, first of all, how many auditions did you take before the Met, and how did how did you track them, so to speak, to you know improve? Um, yeah, good question. So I took fifty four auditions before I won my Met audition. Um, that includes college, summer festival, orchestra, um, and I didn't. Let's see. I didn't um, specifically. I'm just seeing in the, in the chat. I'll let you guys say those if you want to. I, I'm not going to out you. Um, but uh, I didn't necessarily keep track of like I lost ten and then I won one and then I lost you know five. Um, it was more like the way I look at it is, and I Jeremy and I talked a little bit about this. Um, auditions are cumulative. Your preparation for auditions is cumulative. So when I take 10 auditions and I lose all of them, it's not that I have, um, it's not like a grade on a test, it's like you failed over and over, it's not like that. The way I always looked at it was, <clears throat> I prepare for an auditions in a certain way, right? I do a certain series of things, my excerpts go through an assembly line um, in order, at, you know, beforehand, before the audition, and then the audition is a test of how well I prepared. Right, and so I think of um, uh, my audition preparation process itself as the thing that's my asset. Right, it's the thing that I have that I can keep growing. And so every time I have a new audition, when I get ultimately get rejected over and over, I can look back at my process and say what was wrong, what was good, what tweaks can I make inside, what things can I add. Um, to uh, give me a better shot at the next audition. I think the way that I really tracked it was knowing how I prepare. And when I and it's funny because you can like you can get rejected and still have a pretty darn good preparation process. Say you know you do a lot of self recording, you do a lot of like you know um, note note by note learning and muscle memorization. Um, you've researched you know completely research your excerpts and you, you still might get you know rejected over and over because you have not done enough mock auditions or you know maybe there's just one thing from your your massive comprehensive methodical process that's missing and you'll still just get rejected you know that it still results in an audition that doesn't allow you to advance um, so to me it was just a matter of finding all those little places along the preparation uh, process um, that I could tweak and improve and then continuously over and over and over testing that audition preparation process. And I only realized that I had 54 auditions like last year when I was putting to, I was like going through all of my old emails and trying to figure it out. Um, but yeah. I, I heard you say something similar, and I really liked how you put it now and earlier. I feel like I was either listening to that Audition Talk episode one or an interview a fellow had with you, and you said you take an audition and you don't get it, and you feel like you failed and you're starting all the way over, but you're not starting over. You're actually a, a step closer to getting one, and... It's like you're chipping away at getting there, but you're not walking away with like a award or a diploma or anything. So you feel like you're starting over, but you're not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and and that is essentially, in my opinion, what separates the successful people from the unsuccessful people is the persistence, the ability to take bad news and to translate it into something productive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
by the way, those big numbers you're seeing in the uh, in the chat feed, that's um, just minutes of the podcast link. So Laurel oh. hasn't Laurel hasn't actually uh, <laughs> taken, <laughs> taken seventy. Yeah, nor did I think it took <laughs> seventy auditions for you to okay. win. <laughs> I, I'd be impressed. I'd be impressed. Yeah. Though, just like, wow, seventy. That's, that's <laughs> you need to give a talk. Yeah, um, you guys, we have so many yeah. more. Facebook questions, um, but I, we definitely don't have time for them. Um, so I'll just I'll just thank you guys, uh, Will, Emilio, Micah, Ted Jackson again, Alexandra, um, Scott uh, from Taps. Hi Scott, uh, Jade Hales. Thank, thanks so much for your and question. And Micah too, I think Micah. They're actually they're actually all very good questions. So thanks. I think we just we just didn't get to them. Um, man, Rob, thanks so much for joining us. This was really great and Laurel you want to order some pizza or something <laughs> yeah thank you very much Casey said we were going to the grocery store. <laughs> right right no but seriously yeah Rob thank you so much it's really cool to see you again Rob and I bumped into each other briefly while overlapping for a day teaching at Interlochen so it was it was uh, too short so hopefully we should do this again yeah that sounds great and thank you, Casey and Laurel and Ben. I really appreciate what you guys are doing for percussion. It goes it goes right along with my sort of philosophy of, of generosity of information. And I don't think I necessarily would have met you guys up in an, in a situation, you know, besides this. And so it's really cool to uh, to have gotten the chance to chat with you guys about nerdy stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Likewise, I, I I may show up to the Donizetti Opera, but but probably with a few drinks. I think. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll give you the longest, most boring one to come to. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, you just missed a season with five Donizetti operas, so you missed the best one. Um, <laughs> you might have to go to some good operas if you come um, next time. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah. I have played Madame Butterfly before with the nice. Utah, Utah Festival Opera Company, and yeah. What part I, did you play? What part did I play? Wow, that has been such a long time. That was when I was a student. Um, what did I play? I feel like I, I played offstage canon, and then I came down. I want to say I played I played something small. I, I, is there triangle? I feel like I played triangle or something. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's uh, Well, it, you probably would have remembered playing the nipple gong part because you have to play with just a giant setup. We have, like, three huge racks one, two, three, and then it's the different setup for every act also. Um, oh my gosh. Maybe maybe we didn't do it proper. I definitely don't I definitely didn't do that. I feel like I played Tam Tam. Okay. Good part too. Yeah. Yeah. That, which was very good. That's always the piece in the summer when I feel like I'll never I never want to play opera again. And then the summer starts and then I hear Madame Butterfly like in a commercial or like in a movie and I'm like, oh, I miss opera. I it's want to go back. Really good. Yeah. I'm. I. I really like Puccini. I know. I know you guys. We wrapped up already. I really like. <laughs> do you Do you know the Puccini Requiem? There's no percussion in it. No. Okay. So ev everybody, go listen to the Puccini Requiem. Find a good recording. Don't go to YouTube and find some college group doing it or something. Find a good, like, high quality recording. It's a it's a very short requiem. I don't even know if it technically constitutes a requiem because it's just the the first movement text, um, but it's really really pretty. Anywho, um, cool. check that out. Music's cool. Okay, guys, <laughs> thanks so much for your work and your segments. And yeah, yeah, they were awesome. Thanks for teaching us about Alan Abel. Yeah, of course. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Catch you on the next episode. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.